Hello, everyone. Welcome back to watch another episode of um, Honesty About Anxiety. And today's episode, we're going to talk with Shaniqua about how to help your children with anxiety. Because uh, that's a big issue as well, how to understand that your child has anxiety and how to help them. So hi, Shaniqua. Hello, Perret. It is such a pleasure to be here with you and your audience. Thank you so very much for inviting me to stop by to talk a little bit about this anxiety. Mm -hmm. Well, to start with, let's talk about a little bit of yourself. Well, you know, I am also an anxiety sufferer. You know, I've suffered with anxiety myself um, and my children. So I have a little experience from it. But the basis of my experience does come from my nursing career. I've been a registered nurse for over 20 years. And um, I'm still in the health and wellness space where I get to help people to just reconnect with their well-being. So this way that they, as they're out serving the world, they don't subtract anything from themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you've seen a lot of people uh, in the medical, I believe there's a lot of people that you see as a nurse. I yes. didn't even think about that, how much anxiety you see in that environment. Yes. And it plays a big role that I don't think that we pay much attention to. It plays a big role on how we do everything else. So I think mental health doesn't get the attention that it deserves because um, as a doctor, if you are prescribing, say, a blood pressure medicine, somebody has high blood pressure, you're giving them the blood pressure medicine and you give them the medicine, you're like, here, take this and be well. We know that wellness doesn't automatically come to it. It's going to take some, um, you know, lifestyle changes that's going to mm -hmm help the medicine. Like, so the medicine itself is not always the, the thing that makes the change. The change is when you are ready to take those steps to correct your lifestyle. And if you're suffering from anxiety, if you're suffering from depression or any other type of mental health disorder, it can predispose whether or not you're going to actually follow the routine, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to start looking at um, the whole person, the person holistically, meaning that we're looking at their mind, we're looking at their body, we're looking at their environment even mm -hmm. to be able to say whether or not this individual is going to be able to go forward and to uh, become well, to become healthy with this mm -hmm. condition that we've diagnosed them with. Okay. Yeah. That's really very important to pay attention on. Yes. So how do you first start uh, acknowledging anxiety for yourself or from other people first or what age? Well, I, I want to say I was a teenager. I was mm -hmm. a teenager when I had my first experience of anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was, it, it all stemmed from an event. So I, I think I probably was about 13, 13 years old. And there was an event that I wanted to go to. And my mother told me no. Okay. She said, Shaniqua, you cannot go to this event. It was it was like a concert, but it was in like a, you know, one of those community rooms, you know, campus, you know, rooms. And my mother was like, no way, shape or form, are you at 13 years old going to, you know, to this event where there's going to be all of these people? And I was upset. I was mm -hmm. very upset that my mother was telling me that I couldn't do something that I, in my mind, had convinced myself that I wanted to do. Mm-hmm. Lo and behold, there was a traumatic incident that occurred at that, you know, that that place that I wanted to go right. to. And a lot of people lost their lives. Wow. So I started to internalize bits and pieces of that to say that because I actually had thought about being rebellious. OK. Mm -hmm. And I had even that was like the first time I had ever thought about maybe I should sneak out. How could I do it? Would I be able to get away with it? And although I didn't. I still started to harbor some feelings like you were almost there. Okay. You were almost there and you almost lost your life. And it was enough to trigger some level of anxiety in my young body. Mm -hmm. And when I had my first anxiety attack, I remember that uh, my brother was out the house, my older brother, and he was out the house and I was sleeping. And I just woke up in this panic. I mean, I was sweating. My heart was palpitating. And I was asking my mom, I was crying out, where's my brother? Where is he? Where is he? Where is he? My mother had 
call him on the phone to get him to uh, just talk to me, to help to calm me. Right. But see, no one ever said that that was anxiety. Okay. I just grew up knowing that that was an instant that happened that one time. I didn't know if it was coming back. I didn't know if it was going to be something regularly occurring in my life, but I just knew it was something that happened. No one ever put a diagnosis behind it. Mm -hmm. I just knew that that was an experience that I had had. Mm -hmm. Fast forward many, many, many years later, yeah. I began to experience the anxiety again. There used to be a time when um, if it was a heavy downpour of rain, Mm -hmm. I would panic. I would automatically associate death. So if I woke up in the middle of the night and there was a big major storm and I'm hearing the rain come down, my mind would automatically associate somebody's dying. Oh, wow. Why? Because there was a traumatic event that had occurred in my life. And my niece, Equasia, she had been shot and killed the night that it had been a, tor you know, a torrential rain. Mm -hmm. Now in my mind... I'm associating the two. Mm -hmm. Every time I heard the ambulance go by, my heart would, you know, would flutter. Mm -hmm. I would start to panic. I would start to think the worst in every situation. And so I began to recognize the signs of anxiety in my own life. So when I started to see the signs of anxiety in, my, in, in the lives of one of my children, I, I realized and I recognized it. And to be truthful with you all, I blamed myself. Mm -hmm. I'm like, oh my gosh, okay. I passed this down. I passed this down to my to my child. How do you realize that? Like, what are, what were the not like the the thing, but what were the signs that told you that that was generational? Well, there was nothing that told me that it was generational. That's the thing. In our minds, our minds tell us that everything that we can't explain has to be generational. It doesn't necessarily, right? You know, genetics is, is a small factor. Major factors we should look at would be our environment, would be our okay. relationships, right? Um, so, so we always want to blame things on genetics. But to be honest with you, genetics is only a small portion of it. But it's our mindset that plays the bigger role, right? It's the mindset. So um, that's how I was able to identify. But I had to remind myself that it was not my doing per se, right? Because who would do that? Who would willingly, purposely yeah. put something that they suffered with, didn't have much information or knowledge about, who would put that on their children? So I say mm -hmm. genetics plays a small portion. It's not the biggest picture of it. Mm -hmm. Would you say it's more behavior? That's something that they witnessed as seeing you being scared or you having anxiety in that moment? I wouldn't necessarily say that it was from watching me, but I think it's just something that we all can experience, mm -hmm. right? So someone who has a bout of anxiety, it doesn't mean that you're going to have anxiety every day of your life, right? Mm -hmm. I think through the times, I think through the world that we live in, like mm -hmm. 2020 was a rough year. Oh my gosh. Yes. It was a rough year for all of us. And we were exposed to things. Our children were exposed to things that they had never seen before. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's not so much that my kid watched me because, you know, as parents, we had mm -hmm. a lot of stuff from our children. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's not till now my, you know, my kids are older, but it's not till now that they know that I had depression. Okay. I didn't show that. Mm -hmm. I was strong. I put on the happy face, you know, I smiled, you know, if I had to cry, I would go in the bathroom. I would cry at night when they were in bed. So I never, I never exhibited these behaviors because again, we're thinking that, oh, if we show them this, this is going to be a part of their story. Mm -hmm. So I think it was more so environmental. And I'm also going to say this, it was the lack of communication about what I had experienced. See, having had the experience oh. of depression and anxiety, I should have been having the conversation with my children. 
Okay. Rather than shielding them, allowing them to think that mommy was the superhero and that nothing ever affected her, I ended up showing them that that's the way the world wants you to show up. Mm -hmm. right? Your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, put them to the side. You got work to do. You got to be a mom. You got to be a dad. You got to you got to be this the savior of the world. So I think the lack of communication about the struggles that I was having, I believe that that could have been a part of the precursor to say, you know, to, to build these these lack of coping mechanisms in, in my children. Mm -hmm. I actually like that you pointed it out, like the, the conversation about it. I like your T-shirt as well. It says mental, yes, health. mental health matters. <laughs> because uh because all those things when actually be just what you were talking about, when you had those conversations, those those conversations actually help with everybody's mental health, not just kids, everybody's. You have to have those conversations with people, with other people, with therapists. Because um, like you said, when you're holding it in, mm -hmm. You can't change it when it's just inside. You have to say it out loud to somebody yeah. or talk with somebody or teach as a practitioner or coach. You teach it to other how to cope with it. Yes, absolutely. But then also with all my other guests as well, we pointed out like when we teach it to others, we need somebody else to look at us from outside. You know, like we also need somebody to talk with things out. Absolutely. Teachers need teachers, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. We don't know everything. Um, and we all like to be seen. We all like to be acknowledged. We all like to have that supporting, loving, nurturing uh, support system that we so willingly give to others. Like, mm -hmm. I know for myself, I'm everybody's support system. Mm -hmm. Oh, you having a bad day? Call me. You know, mm -hmm. hence the name Shaniqua inspires. I bring about this inspiration, this motivation, this encouragement. And I remember one day someone asked me, they say, Shaniqua, we love what you do. You're so motivating. You're so inspiring. But who inspires you? Who inspires Very you? Mm -hmm. So it is, it is the fact that I need to be fed. So just as much as I'm out here pouring out to the world, I need my cup filled too. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have the same way. I, I like I do my a uh, lot of my work with questions, asking the right questions from people so they can find the right questions from inside. But I need somebody to come in. I can ask myself the same questions, but I need somebody else to come in occasionally and ask questions that I don't ask. That's right. Like somebody, I get so excited when somebody comes and asks me a question that I don't, I never asked for myself before. I'm just like. Ooh, there's something new that I can work on or like think about. So those questions are very important. And that actually made me think about like, what questions should we ask from our kids? Yeah. Yeah. And I think a daily check-in and, and I know, you know, the kids are getting back to school and they're getting into the swing of things as parents and I, and myself included. Um, I always ask, well, how was your day? And I used to get the same response good. Mm -hmm. And then I'd say, well, what was so good about it? Mm -hmm. I ate lunch. <laughs> we had, lunch. What they had to lunch. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> you don't, you don't get much about the feelings like, but we should ask questions like, you know, how was your mental health? Did you feel heard? Um, did anyone say something that caused you to feel a certain kind of a way? Like we should be tapping into their feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Their emotions, their mental wellness. Like, did you get upset? Did you get angry today? Did you find mm -hmm. yourself feeling joy today? What gave you joy today? Like, so we really should find and be able to pinpoint on those questions and not just the generic questions that says, well, how was your day? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you might get an okay. Mm -hmm. I get a fine. You might get a good, you know, so it's very vague, just as vague as the question is, they're going to give a vague answer. So you want to find the right questions. What emotions did you feel today? What stimulated mm -hmm. emotions? And that gets mm -hmm. into a deeper place of understanding where your child's mental well-being is. Mm -hmm. That actually made me think about right now when uh, children have their emotions, 
uh, I just thought about it right now when we were talking. When they get to some kind of emotion, let's say they get angry about something or sad, and usually parents, they have a reaction yes. to that emotion. They either say, like, you can't talk with me like that or, mm -hmm. like, don't be sad, don't cry or something. We react instead of actually it takes us because it's, it's natural yes. but it was just like some of the moments depends what they what the action is what the kids are doing but some of it is reaction but then you have to learn to have that pause and mm -hmm. sit with the child and ask and have a conversation about the feeling instead of reacting to yes. that feeling yes that so we ask questions so that way we can react so we wanna gauge our reaction, but we really should be asking the right questions so that we can listen and support and see how we can help them to work through it. But mm -hmm. we're dealing with our own mental health, right? And mm -hmm. sometimes that can be a lot. And mm -hmm. one of the things that I've learned is that I have to make certain that I'm well. Okay. Because if I'm not well, if they come to me saying, oh, I'm angry, then I get angry too. So I get very reactive. But if I'm mm -hmm. feeling well, if I'm feeling supported, if I'm feeling nurtured, then I can do the same for them. So mm -hmm. it's extremely important that we all pay attention to our own mental wellness in order to be able to support and to nurture our children, our loved ones, our spouses, anyone who depends on us. But mm -hmm. we have to be well ourselves. So... Let's go to the children now again. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, start? What would be your first signs that your child has anxiety? Hmm. You have to watch. And I know as a parent, uh, my ears, my ears used to be my superpowers, right? I used to have those like bionic hearing, you know, so when they're a baby, you can hear when they're crying. If they're in the other room, you can hear when they're waking up. Like we just have these supersonic hearing. Mm-hmm. But then now we have to go into the vision. Like we now need to have superpowers in our eyes where we can be able to look at our child and be able to tell when something's not right. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I'm not saying that we're going to snoop or pry into their personal space, but we want to watch for cues. Mm -hmm. Is there a change in their, their, their body habits, the way they, they sit, their posture? Um, is, it a, is it a difference between the way they come in the house you know, are they slamming doors? Are they being distanced? Are they just going in their room? Are they just closing their door? Right. And a lot of times we just say, oh, well, they're, they're coming of age. We'll give them time. We'll give them space. But sometimes mm -hmm. that's a, it's almost like a defense mechanism to hide. Mm -hmm. Because again, I think back to myself and I think about how I used to hide to never show them my emotions. So if you have a child who wants to be by themselves all the time, yes, it could be coming of age, but it could also be, I don't want you to see how I'm feeling. Mm -hmm. And also when you're pointing that out, because they don't understand those feelings yet. So, yeah. okay, you say it's coming of age, but somebody has to be there helping them to become an age yes. instead of them like same age people, kids, oh, don't know either. Yes. what is going on so now all those kids by themselves trying to figure out mm -hmm. what's going on instead of having that one adult who steps in and explains them a little bit about well this is what's going on and some mm -hmm. of the issues that some of the feeling that you're having let's say teenagers they having anxiety like anxiety those are just because of what your body is doing there's no outside reason for your anxiety it's just your body is changing mm -hmm. and you have that thought or that reaction just because it's a chemical balance. It's your, imbalance. it's your hormones. And you don't know about anything about hormones. You don't know what it feels like. You don't know, know what it's supposed to look like. Um, and you're not, you don't know how to support it. Just think about the diet that most kids have. You know, those those diets are not conducive to this surge of hormones. They're full of sugar. They're full of caffeine and and all all sorts of stuff. So it, it's like their eating habits are not even supporting um, what it is that they're feeling on the inside. So why would they not? Mm -hmm. Why would they not experience the same things that we feel as adults? Mm -hmm. 
So it is important to make certain that we're paying attention to our children, um, that we're watching them, we're noticing if something is different. But again, to our defense, if we're busy, you know, some of us, you know, single parents, you're, you're working at one but two jobs. Um, some of us have dreams and aspirations. We want to build businesses. We want to have these, these other lives, so to speak. And we get so busy. We get so caught up. We don't see or we see what's being given on the surface. And because we've got to run to the next shift, because we've got to run to the next task, we just say, OK, they said they're OK, then they must be OK. And we go on with it. So sometimes it does take a pause. Sometimes it does say, you know what, let's investigate a little bit deeper to, you know, these changes that I'm seeing, um, you know, the feelings that they might have. And even if they don't express it, talk about it anyway. Mm -hmm. say, well, you know what, let's sit down and let's talk about mm -hmm. generalized emotions. Exactly. You generalize know? the conversation so they don't have to take it personally. Exactly. That's really good and right with the kids and everything. To generalize the conversation so it's they don't feel like you're actually it's towards them always if they're not open for that conversation yet. So generalize and just talk about how it is before. What what would be you give you advice for uh parents how to generalize that conversation about it? So anger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, remember, remember, um, you know, when they were little and you were reading those kids books, those characters in those children's book always experienced something, whether it was loneliness, sadness, you know, anger, you know, you know, so we have to kind of go back to to those days. Maybe they're a little bit too old to read storybooks about that, but you can have conversations based off of that. And you know, one thing that I do with my children, we used to ride around, I had, I had my mommy van and we used to ride around in the mommy van and um, we would see something. So we'd be somewhere within the vicinity of the school and I would notice a kid and he was like, you know, angry and throwing his book bag down. And I would always look and bring my, kid, my kid's attention to it. So if they're in the back and they didn't see it, look at him, look at him. He's getting angry. He's throwing his book bag down. Look at him. Now let's discuss this. So it's not them that I'm upset. You know, I'm not, I'm not scolding mm -hmm. them. Look at this person here. So we use other mm -hmm. people as examples. Mm -hmm. How would you handle emotions? Mm -hmm. But then we would always say like, well, what do you think is wrong with him? What do you think mm -hmm. happened to him? Why yeah. do you think he's acting that way? Mm -hmm. What do you think he needs right now? How, how, how could you support him? If I was his mother, how could I support him? Right. So we could you, you, you could use other people as examples. If your kid comes home and says, oh, you know, little Timmy did this in school today. Oh, did he really? Well, let's talk about it. Why do you mm -hmm. think little Timmy did that? What do you think his mom should do? What do you think? How, how should his dad support him? Right. So make an example out of real life situations, whether it's something that happened in school to someone they know, whether it's something that you see on TV during a, your favorite programming, uh, whether it's on the news, use different examples to be able to make it. And I, I tell my kids all the time, everything's a teachable moment. I don't mm -hmm. care what it is. Everything is a teachable moment. And if you don't use those things as teachable moments, then you miss an opportunity to generalize it because now it's got to be specific. It's like, oh, you did this and you did that. And you don't want to feel as though you are, you know, you're not their support because all in all, home should be the place where you get away. It mm -hmm. should be a place of peace. It should be your place of solitude in, in your sanctuary. You don't want home to be as tough and as rough as the environment you just left whether it's school, whether it's the workplace, wherever it's at. You want to try to make a sanctuary, um, a place of peace in, in this crazy world that we live in. Mm -hmm. That is true. Well, let's go to this topic because this topic is uh, what a lot of children, a lot of adults as well, and that's also something that can be passed from generation is social anxiety yes let's talk about more about social anxiety we have a lot of experience with social anxiety in my household um and i admit 2020 was a rough year uh it was a rough year for everybody 
But I believe the social anxiety that we dealt with started before then. So if I can be honest, if I will be truthful with myself, um, it did start before then. I saw the warning signs beforehand. When we were on shutdown or scared to go out, Mm -hmm. it made it worse. So Mm -hmm. social anxiety is really a, a sense where you are disrupted, like something inside of you, it gets triggered by your social interactions. So when you're at home, you're in your, your solitude place, you're okay, you're, you're tolerable with the people who are normally around you. But in the, the event that there's someone new around you, in the event that you have to go somewhere else, that's when social anxiety triggers your anxiety, your panic, your stress, right? Um, it's from being in those social settings. In my household, it even got to the point where I had to sign my son up for remote school Mm -hmm. because sending him to school was like torture. Okay. It was literally torture to him. I I think it was for a lot of kids in that that year, a lot of kids, that's what happened in years after They're scared. They're in school, they're wearing masks, the teachers are sanitizing everything, people are wearing gloves. Like it, it was like they were in a movie that they had never experienced mm-hmm. before. Mm-hmm. So they were scared. And and I think my my son got angry. He got okay. angry, like, so you're going to make me go to this place that may or may not be safe. Mm-hmm. You're gonna make me go there. And even though all the other kids were going, you know, we were going, you know, we were doing, they was, they said the schools were open again. So it was like, yeah, you got to go back. He was very, very angry. And mm-hmm. that anger then started to go beyond, you know, it, it started to now be the driving force. So yeah, we're dealing with this social anxiety, but anger is the one that's taking over. So that was kind of his outlet for his uh, anxiety. Anger was the outlet yes. for the way... Yes. Came out. Yes. So I had to learn that. Right. Because I'm thinking this. Oh, he's just he's just acting out. He's just trying to get his way. He's trying to control me. He's trying to manipulate me. But he was angry. Mm-hmm. And his anger could have been based in fear. Mm-hmm. He could have been saying, I'm scared to go out there and you're mm-hmm. forcing me to go out there. But if I kick and I scream. Just maybe I don't have to go out there. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is this is the real stuff that we deal with. And not just children have social anxiety. Adults have social anxiety adults as well. Same way. Adults, a lot of adults have social anxiety. Yeah. So we have to learn how to see these things and then be able to offer a level of support. So. And and what's funny is my son, he wanted to do remote school before the pandemic. So he was pro remote school because he was tired of that social interaction that was driving his nerves bad. He didn't Mm -hmm. like it. He didn't like the social interaction. He did it because that's what we do, but he didn't like it. Mm -hmm. And then once we started doing the remote school because of the pandemic, he was like, yes, I finally got what I wanted. And then when they say you got to go back, he was like, no, you cannot send me back. And so we had to deal with a lot of the anger and all the other emotions that were rising up trying to protect him. Mm -hmm. They were his defense mechanism. It didn't have anything to do with me. It wasn't a personal attack, but we take everything as a personal attack. Why is he doing this to me? And it's hurting my feelings, but he is crying out in the only way he knows how. Mm -hmm. So I had to start listening. I couldn't do things the way I did them, you know, before. I couldn't do things the way I did it as a child. Like I had to do something different because again, we're living in a different world. This world Mm -hmm. is different. It changes periodically. And this generation of children, they have a different world to live in. They have different worries. They have different responsibilities than we ever had. Mm -hmm. Now, do we give out passes? Does it say that you get to act out when you want to? No, no, Mm -hmm. it doesn't. 
but it does say that I understand. I have to, I have Mm -hmm. to put my hat of understanding on and I have to try my best to understand. And just maybe if you talk to me just a little bit, Mm -hmm. I can understand a little bit more each time. I mean, we don't have to sit and hold hands, but can you just share just a little and Mm -hmm. a little and a little little, until we get to the place where I have a better understanding as to what you're feeling. Mm -hmm. And then give them tools. That's what one thing. First thing is to like, acknowledge it and then start, like you say, start listening. Mm-hmm. And then after you start listening, then to find the tools to give them. Yes. What were the tools that you used? Therapy. We're mm-hmm. pro therapy in this house. Yep. Like I said, mental health matters. We're pro therapy. Yep. So we had therapy. We did meditation. Mm hmm. We did quiet time. Mm-hmm. We did bonding time. Mm-hmm. Um, despite me and my busyness, I used to make time. I used to put him on my schedule. He would love that. Oh my gosh, he mm-hmm. loved that. He loved getting on my calendar. I'd say, oh. "Oh, take mom's calendar. Put yourself on it. Pen- pencil in a date and time that we're mm-hmm. going to have mommy and me time." That's a really good tool for all the parents, actually. Yeah. I have like that in the schedule because. That makes children feel special. They, they, some of them, they know they're important. Some of them might know that not a little bit less important. Mm-hmm. But that makes them actually like really important. Oh, I'm in the schedule. Well, I'm on the schedule. She's not going to cancel on me. I'm on the schedule. Yeah. Because mm-hmm. we'll make time for everything that's on our schedule. Our children learn that we're driven by the schedule. If there's soccer practice, we get there. If it's Cub Scout meeting, we get there. If it's Girl Scout meetings, we get there. If Whatever it is, whatever is on the schedule, we make it happen. So we mm-hmm. show our kids that, we teach our kids that. So put them on the schedule mm-hmm. and let them title it whatever they want to title it. Mm-hmm. What, what I used to call mine, I used to call mine, um, uh, quality time with my face. Oh, because he's my twin. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> so you name it something enjoyable. You name it something funny. You don't. You don't say appointment with meeting with. No, come on, that's boring. That's uh-huh. that's regular. Like you title it something fun, mm-hmm. something that mm-hmm. they will laugh at, something that they will remember, and they'll know that you remember because you have it. Listen, it's almost like a code name. So if anybody, you know, gets my calendar, they'll be like, I have no idea. Was this a facial appointment she's going to? Like, what is this about? And it's like, it's our little language. Mm -hmm. And it makes you feel even more special when you're on the calendar. Mm -hmm. And then you work through it. Yes, yes, yes. And sometimes a little spontaneity goes a long way. Um, So minds would come in my room and say, you want to watch this show with me? Yes, I do. I'm like, give me, give me just a few minutes. Let me finish up what I'm doing. And I would close up the computer. I would put the phone down and I would make time for the show. Even spont- mm-hmm. spontaneous things that were not on the calendar. Cause this way you show your, your child that you care. I grew to love a show that I don't wouldn't normally watch. I don't normally care for it, but I grew mm-hmm. to love it. And he says, oh, you know, you love that show. And I said, no, baby, I really don't like the show, but I like the time that we spend together. So mm-hmm. I watch. Mm-hmm. So if it has to be my favorite show, it is my favorite show because it's my favorite thing to spend time with you because I don't want him to get it twisted. I don't want him to think that it's the show that means the most to me. It's not the show. And I will out my him. I don't mm-hmm. like it. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's okay. It's watchable. But it's the time with you that mm-hmm. matters. Mm-hmm. I actually, it's pretty cool. I have like, I have this thing that uh, I do with my daughter because I don't play video games at all. Mm-hmm. My daughter likes video games and some of them. So I actually occasionally I took time to play Roblox. Yeah. Because that she feels so special when mm-hmm. I do it with her. Yeah. And I don't understand the game. Most yeah. of the time she comes over and plays my character for me. So now I know a little bit more of it. But I do it because she likes it and I enjoy the time when she does it with me. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And I think in their minds, we're the experts. 
right? Because we're the adults, we're the grownups, we're the big people. We're always seen as the experts. We're the ones that teach them and tell them what to do. But it's nice when the tables get turned, when mom or dad doesn't know everything. Like, I don't know anything about Roblox, but they are now the teacher. Exactly. They are the ones that are the holder of the knowledge and the wisdom. And they like the fact that they get to teach us something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like, I want to point out as well for maybe some viewers, not to think that the time that you put in a schedule for a child is the only time. No, you had those, all those other times, but this is just like extra, extra special time for like dealing with anxiety or like having that special time, yes. like extra special time. And especially if you have more than one child, um, it's important. And I know as parents, you know, we're, we're trying to, you know, for lack of a better term, we're killing two birds with one stone. Like we're taking them both to the park. We're doing everything together. But sometimes it is very important to still have that single time, that one-on-one -on -one time, whether you take one with you to the store and then the other one, you know, does something else, you know, pleasurable, of course, but, you know, mm -hmm. this is this is this one's time. And then the next one would have their time. And um, it creates memories. It creates moments for them. And then hopefully when they get older, when they run into stressful situations, they have something to to now pull back on to say, oh, I remember that time when me and mom meditated. I remember that time when me and mom went to the park, just us. It gives them those those moments, especially if they're children in, in a household with multiple children. Mm -hmm. and, and with my kids, they, they had a two household. So with their father mm -hmm. and then he had kids, I was trying to do everything that I could to support my kids in their environment, but also teach them that they matter. Like, so mm -hmm. I understand. And, and, and my youngest son, he has um, middle child syndrome. Like he's the youngest, mm -hmm. On, on my end, but he's in the middle, you know, amongst mm -hmm. the whole. And he had that really, really bad. So it was always the older one, the younger ones, the older ones, the younger mm -hmm. one. So now he's caught in the middle. But in my household, it's like, you're the baby. What you talking about? What's your problem? Mm -hmm. but we have to be able to understand our children in their, their complexities. And uh, social anxiety is something really, really different i'll say you know it's no it's no more difficult than anything else that we have to deal with we've had to deal with some serious things in this day and age but it's just yet another thing that we have to be aware of and try our very best to um, support it so i make certain that you know my son feels love and 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 he's much older now than we were when the when we were in the midst of all of the, the issues, he's older now. And sometimes I'll go in his room and I know he wants to be by himself. I get it. You got your space. I'm now knocking on doors in my own house. Go figure. Mm -hmm. Right. I'm knocking on doors, asking for permission to come in. Um, something that I didn't think I should have to do, but I, I, I conformed. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll go and I'll just grab him and I'll hug him. And he's, oh, oh, my, oh, my. And I said, that hug wasn't for you. Mm -hmm. for me mm -hmm. because there are some times when moms need hugs there are some times when moms need you know a little bit of attention and and I try to teach them like it's not always about you the world is not going to always revolve around you sometimes you have to do things for other people as well so I think when you start to teach them that yes your feelings are valid but so are the feelings of others so you can't just say everything to me because I have feelings and mm -hmm. now I just hide it if I'm feeling sad, if I'm feeling heartbroken, if I'm hurt, I will say it. Mm -hmm. I will go in the room and I'll be like, I'll make the grand announcement. I'm not feeling good. Mm -hmm. and here's what's wrong with me. It's not a physical hurt. It's an emotional hurt. Mm -hmm. I'm feeling sad. I'm feeling like I'm missing this person. And like, so I now have become more vocal about my feelings. Gone are the days where I'm going to hide my feelings, trying to protect someone who has their own feelings. No, I need to use the teachable moment. Mm -hmm. If that teachable moment comes from me, mm -hmm. you still need that lesson. Mm -hmm. And they learned as well, like, okay, this is the emotion. Mm -hmm. This is their re, uh, right reaction yeah. to yes. their emotion. Mm -hmm. And then when they're going to have that emotion sometime in their life, maybe years from now in adulthood, then they will, they have that maybe not 
acknowledgeable memory of it when you acted this way, but in their subconscious, they have this memory of yes. you reacting in this way. Mm -hmm. It just automatically comes out without them even thinking about it. It's just like the body reacts on that old memory of that. Because system. most of the time, people are going to remember the reaction. Mm -hmm. They're going to forget the rationale, like the why. Why did this mm -hmm. happen? They're going to forget that. But what holds true and what burns into people's heart is is the reaction. And I believe Maya Angelou has a, a quote that says, you know, you know, people will forget about what you said. They'll forget about, you know, but it, it's it's how you made them feel. Right. So they'll forget the things that you said. They'll forget the things that you did. But it's how you made them feel. That's going to be the important part to them. That's the part that they're going to hold on to. So how did you react Mm -hmm. Yes, you were sad. How did you react? Mm -hmm. Yes, you were angry. How did you react? Yes, mm -hmm. you were lonely. How did you react? So it's the reactions that are going to make the lasting impression. So we have to mm -hmm. be mindful of how we react. We have to be mindful of how we teach them to react. Mm -hmm. Actually, now when you, Shaniqua, when you pointed it out, how to react, because I like my main part is teaching happiness. Mm -hmm. And kind of is happiness with breath. So I made this anxiety just to uh, talk with the people who are dealing with anxiety before they can even think about happiness. But how it's important to teach children also how to react when they do feel happy. Mm -hmm. Like, because a lot of people hold that back as well. Yes. Instead of like, okay, you feel happy. It's okay to show it. It's okay to laugh. It's okay to like have good feelings. I love my what my daughter does. Like I have one little video where she does a happiness dance. Nice. You know? Like this, people make that little move. I don't know for what reason people feel like dancing when they have some happy moments. But it's awesome. Happiness is a, a it's a medicine, mm -hmm. right? It's like they say, laughter is the best medicine happiness because happiness is a positive emotion and anything that evokes a positive emotion um, it actually acts as medicine towards the body um, one of my TEDx talks I, I did a talk about um, depression and how um, hope so hope is that feeling of positivity like there there is another way there is another option having that hope it's actually been clinically proven that those positive emotions can reverse those negative emotions with you, like the depression, the anxiety. So if you have hope, if you believe that there is a window of, you know, possibility that things may turn out in your favor, then you eradicate depression. If you have this hope, if you have this faith that all things are going to work out for your good, then you minimize the anxiety because anxiety is based off of the future. Anxiety is I don't know what lies ahead. I don't know what's in that in that closet. You know, when, when kids were little, they used to be scared of the, the, the monster under the bed. I don't know what's under the bed. It's dark. I can't see it. And because I don't know what's under the bed, I have this anxiety and this fear about these monsters being there. If you don't know what the future holds for you, you don't know what you want to be when you grow up. That then creates that, that unknown creates that anxiety. But if you scale yourself back and you say, well, I'm going to stay right here in this moment and I'm going to take it step by step. I'm going to crawl little by little. I'm going to creep up to that closet door and I'm going to be able to then see. But I'm not going to worry about the closet when I'm nowhere near it. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to take my baby steps to move forward. So it's when you have that positivity, like into happiness, like mm -hmm. into joy and hope and faith. All of those are secret sauces that we can use to help to minimize those anxious feelings. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, Shaniqua, let's say, uh, have this question. How do you um, measure the progress mm -hmm. when you're working with social anxiety? How do you see that what you're doing is actually working? How do you measure it? Kind of? I'm a big baby stepper. Okay. I, I like measuring things step by step. Mm -hmm. So the fact that you came out the room, yay, we celebrate. Woo, look who's here. We celebrate. Mm -hmm. 
right? Yeah, we know the ultimate goal is to get you out the house and in the room full of people, but we don't, we don't wait till we get all the way over there to celebrate. Mm -hmm. We celebrate the fact that you said yes, that you mm -hmm. would go, right? Because mm -hmm. you should have said no. Yeah. So we take it step by step, moment by moment. You know, I, I laughed at my my son. Um, we went out to dinner um, for my mom's birthday, and I was surprised that I was a yes because if I go up to him normally and say, "Hey, you want to go out to eat?" No, no, because he don't want to be bothered. Mm -hmm. But he realized this is for grandma's birthday. He realized that he was doing something for someone else, and that mm -hmm. was important to him. So we mm -hmm. have to celebrate the fact that he put his needs aside. He put his fear, his anxiety aside for the, the need of someone else. And he showed up and boy, I was just snapping pictures. I was like, ah, we don't get these moments too often. I was making sure it was recorded and documented in time. And I was happy. Mm -hmm. There was a moment when I looked at him and he was happy. Mm -hmm. And he still protected him while he was out. He sat at the table. He sat on the inside. He didn't have to be on the outside. He didn't have to interact with all the other people. And he was safe and he was okay. So that's one thing. So yes, you want to take the baby steps, but you also want to make certain that you're protecting them. You mm -hmm. never want someone to take a step and then they're going to regret that they took that step in the first place. Mm -hmm. So You make certain whatever environment you're trying to get them in, whichever interaction you want them to get them to, you're going to make certain that they're going to be safe mm -hmm. and you allow them to do it their way. Mm -hmm. So wear what you want to wear. Sit where you want to sit. Like you get to choose because one of the reasons why people get so fearful is because they lack the control. Okay. So as parents, we tell them to do everything. Put your shoes on. Time to wake up. It's time to do this. It's time to do that. So we have to try to give them some type of control. And if they feel as though that they, and, and that's where eating disorders comes from. Eating disorders is something where it's the only thing that you literally can control. Okay. As a baby, sure, you put the bottle in their mouth, but guess what? If the baby doesn't want the bottle, they spit it out. Mm -hmm. So there's no real way that we get to force feed people, but we try it each and every day. We try to get people to behave the way we want them to behave, to do, to go what it is, where it is we want them to go and want them to do. So it's about control. So still, as they're taking these baby steps, you, you celebrate along the way, but you give them the options, give them options. Mm -hmm. So that they feel that they have some sense of control. Mm -hmm. And those are some of the things that we've done. And, and when we get that, so like I said, when he made it to the, you know, to the family dinner, that was a big thing. That was mm -hmm. a big thing. So we don't wait until, you know, that moment we celebrate each step along the way. When he mm -hmm. comes out of his room, shut. now I don't make a big scene like I want to, because I know that's going to scare him. Cause I want to start cheering. I want to, but he'll see me looking at him and then you'll see him start to like, just kind of turn his head. Like she looking at me and I'm like, what's the matter? I can't look at my face. Mm -hmm. like, what? Like, okay, okay. Let me turn back around. Let me turn back around. But you, you have to do it in a way so that they feel comfortable, but you also mm -hmm. want to, you want to acknowledge the fact that you see them, mm -hmm. that you see them trying. Mm -hmm. And I think that right there alone makes a big difference to them because it's a lot, you're allowing them to be who they are. You're allowing them to find their way. You're just supporting them on their journey. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. That's pretty good as well. Well, our hour is starting to wrap up now as well. So it was a lot of good information and all the yes. things. Um, before we're going to wrap it up, well, let's talk about more what the, the things that you do and how people can contact with you. Oh, absolutely. And I had so much fun. And, and as you can tell, like this is my passion right here, um, not only supporting uh, other individuals in their own mental health, my, my mental health journey is, is it's a journey, you know? So mm -hmm. uh, anything that I learn, anything that I gain or, or find value in, I love to share it. I love to talk about it so that people feel supported on their journey as well. So um, I am officially known as Dr. Shaniqua Johnson. Um, I'm not a medical doctor. That's why I don't like to use the title 
title often because sometimes it confuses people, especially when they hear that I am in the health profession. So they just automatically think that I'm a doctor in medicine. And I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to be. Um, but I am, uh, I do hold an honorary uh, doctorate, a PhD, in fact. And I'm very proud of the work that I've done um, to achieve it. And it is about being a lifelong learner. So I am also the CEO of A Better You LLC, where I am healthy, helping busy, multitasking professionals reprioritize. Re That's the way I like to call it. Reprioritize their well-being so that they okay. understand that as they're out serving the world 100%, they do not have to subtract anything from themselves. So I help them to reestablish uh, boundaries and connections with them, with their health and their wellness. Um, and I also have a passion where I love helping aspiring entrepreneurs. I help them to get their business started. So I'm a certified business coach as well. So mm -hmm. I like to hold hands and walk people through as they're building up their business, getting the, their uh, promotion on, on social media, getting you know all eyes on them. And sometimes they have a little anxiety too. So they need me to be like, oh, calm down. It's okay. Like we're gonna do this interview. I have one of my my mentees um, now. She's she's panicking because I've got her doing the speaker uh, platform. She's speaking on this panel, and I'm like, "You're okay. You're mm -hmm. okay. You've got the information. You've got the tools. You have the knowledge. You are qualified." And I made certain I I affirmed her. I said, "You were qualified." I said, "You bring something to the table as well." So it's not just about you know the people who's bringing the ham and the and the turkey. I said, "You're you're bringing." The plates, you're mm -hmm. bringing the forks and they can't have the turkey. They can't have the ham and the macaroni and cheese and all of that stuff if they don't have any plates or if they don't have any forks. So you're just as important. So we all bring something to the table. So I love to inspire and ignite that passion in, in, in rising entrepreneurs as they are starting on their journey. Um, so I do a lot of work with that. I'm also a publisher. So I help people write and produce their books. Um, so I have many, many passions and I tap into each and every one of those. And I am just on this, this plight to make certain that I'm spreading encouragement and inspiration because there was a time in my life where I didn't feel inspired. I didn't feel empowered. I didn't feel like I was important. So the, the love and the, the, the connection that I put into my businesses is what it is that I felt that I needed. And that's what makes me excellent at what it is that I do, bringing forth inspiration to, to everyone so that they can see themselves the way I see them. So you get to mm -hmm. borrow my eyes. <laughs> so that's what I like when uh, now they're with the coaches and everything is people are, they're not just teaching something that they learned from the book. They're yeah. teaching something that they actually experienced. There's that's something true. that they've been through. And uh, it's not just okay, this is what the standard is because the standard doesn't work for everybody. So when you experience this, you can uh, give it more personalized view to others as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, and, it, and it's, it's important that we remain, uh, we remain individuals. Mm -hmm. We don't want to be carbon copies of other mm -hmm. people. So what I do is I share my experience, you hear my journey, but then you're going to do it your way. And mm -hmm. I'm just going to support you. And I say, listen, I tried that. You might want to try it this way because it might save you some time, might save you some money, but you're still allowed to do it your way. If that's the way you want to do it, then that's the way you do it. And I support you in that. So we don't want to just go around making carbon copies. We don't want to make it like cookie cutters that we all look the same. Our businesses are all the same. We want there to be some individuality. Because that's how you're going to attract the right people. You know, it's your spirit. It's your quirkiness. It's you with your anxiety. It's you with your depression. It's you with your, your, all your baggages. That mm -hmm. gives you your qualifications. And that's how you're going to attract the same people. If you only want perfect people, well, good luck with that. But mm -hmm. for me, I'm going after those who can see themselves in me to say, mm -hmm. oh, I've been through that. Oh, I deal with this. Those are the people. Mm -hmm. Because that's a, that's one thing as well. Everybody is imperfect on their own way, and everybody is also perfect in their own way. You it's know, it's not imperfect. I like that. <laughs> perfect that everybody has to be perfect in one way, 
Yes. No, everybody perfect in our own way. We're everybody imperfect in our own way as well. Exactly. So, but in social media, you're Shaniqua Inspires. That's right. So you can find me everywhere on social media, Shaniqua Inspires, Facebook, Instagram. I'm over there ticking and talking as well. So if you're on mm -hmm. TikTok, you can find me there. I'm on LinkedIn, Shaniqua Inspires, uh, YouTube, Shaniqua Inspires. So pretty much across the board, I'm Shaniqua Inspires because that's what my goal is. My goal is to leave you with some level of inspiration, motivation, and encouragement to say that you can do the things that you are striving to do in this world. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's perfect as well. So, um, and all the uh, links and everything for the viewers, all the links, so as always, are in descriptions as well. So it's easy to just uh, click on the bottom and descriptions, show descriptions, and you get all the links for Shaniqua. So you can contact with her. But uh, for all my guests, you already a little bit talked about happiness, but all my guests, I ask, uh, what is happiness personally for you? Happiness is freedom. Happiness looks like freedom to me. And it's freedom to be able to be exactly who it is that God has called me to be in every facet. So it just doesn't go into my career. It just, just doesn't go into my businesses. It goes in every aspect. At, you know, every facet of my life. So it's having the freedom. It's the freedom to be exactly who it is that I am in exactly the way that I am. And it's okay. It's okay. I love it. I love it. It's beautiful. Yeah. And uh, also uh, say uh, maybe uh, three or some things that things or activities, like simple things that make you feel happy, just like momentarily or big way. Well, um, I'm always happy when I'm taking care of my body. So when I go out for my walks, I'm happy. So I take my daily walk. Mm -hmm. When I drink my water, yes, call me lame if you want to, but I love to drink my water. I love the the benefits that I get of hydrating my cells. That, that's a, a big thing for me. I'm like, that brings me happiness. And knowing that my children are well, that brings me happy as well. Happiness mm -hmm. as well. The, the reason why I asked that question is to, to put, have people to see and point out those little things. Like mm -hmm. every day we have little things that make us feel happy as long as all we have to do is acknowledge it. Yes. It's like, like you were saying, like I thought it was so cute. We were saying like drinking my water. Yes. <laughs> but if that makes you feel happy, that's all that you need. Yes. No, that's all you need. You don't need all those big imagination things that with the big happiness. No, you need those little things that make you feel happy in that specific, specific it's the moment. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, it's the baby step. Okay. Thank you so much, Jenny. It was a beautiful conversation. A lot of good information as well. Thank you. Thank you okay. again for having me. And I hope that I brought value to your platform. Oh, I, I'm sure we did. I, there was a lot of information that I heard and everything. And for the viewers as well, um, I believe you all got something out of it. Thank you so much. And uh, for the viewers, thank you so much for watching. There's all together nine episodes about uh, um, anxiety, honesty about anxiety. There's another uh, podcast with happiness with Pirat if you're ready to watch some episodes from that as well. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Thank you, Shaniqua. Thank you. Thank you for all the viewers and enjoy your day. Bye.